The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he is before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched, Jesus walked by. And he exclaimed, look, here is the Lamb of God. His two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard Jesus John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. There, 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 there's two persons I've thought about over the years that, that sometimes don't get, get put into the first position. John the Baptist is one of them, and there's another fellow in the Old Testament. Sometimes we think about this fellow and wrote in rather negative terms. Uh, and yet, I think in many respects, he is one of the best of the people in the Bible. Naturally, you know who I'm talking about, don't you? Oh, come on now, you must know who I'm talking about. He was the first king of Israel. Now do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about Saul. Saul is looked upon rather negatively, especially because later on in his, his life, what does he do to say? David tries to hunt him down. He tries to look, look everywhere, everywhere looking for David. In some, in some texts, it says he wants to actually wanted to kill him. He was really upset with him because he was no longer going to be his son, was no longer going to follow him. Instead, David was going to take his place. So he was, he was wroth, as the, as the King James Bible would say it. He had wrath in his heart against the, against the young David, who had lived in his house and actually married his, his daughter. But there's another side to Saul. Saul, you see, was a kind of a reluctant warrior. Uh, in many respects, uh, he kind of reminds me, of those, I don't know who the politician was who said this sometime way back in the past, but, uh, but may, maybe some of the politicians today could take a lesson from this guy. But, uh, but he said, you know, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. I don't know who that guy was, but I, I wanted to, I wanted, as soon as he said that, I wanted, I wanted to vote for that guy. <laughs> you know, who was that? Did Lyndon Johnson say that? Maybe, yeah, of course, right. He, maybe he did say that when he decided he wasn't going to run the second term, yeah. That, that made him even more valuable. I want to vote for a guy like that, you know. And that's kind of the way Saul was. Saul, Saul actually was at that time, uh, he was already a respected leader, a commander. <clears throat> he, had, he had led some successful campaigns against the Philistines who were, the, who were the, living over there ne next, next to the coast, next to the Mediterranean, who oft, often gave Israel a lot of difficulties. And so he was already a successful warrior, yet he apparently did not want to have anything to do with this king thing. Now, the king was, king was a, a situation that was not looked upon as being a... a how shall we say, something that was looked with favor upon by, by, by the prophet of that day. And who was the prophet of that day? Uh, well, you should ask. 
The prophet of that day was Samuel. Samuel did not want to have anything to do with this king thing. Because Samuel, you see, was in a position of being a king himself. Whenever one of the prophets later on after Samuel would be Nathan, whenever one of the prophets would show up in, into the land, people would wonder, uh oh, you know, what's he doing here? I mean, uh, what have we done now? Uh, you know, you know, when, when he would show up, pe people, would, people would shake. You know, when he would show up before a king, you know, the, the king would stop what he was doing and wait, wait to see what he, what he wanted. Some of the kings had some rather negative things to say about the prophet. You know, almost like, you know, what are you doing here? What did I do now? Something like that. You know, they, they, they had this, this, this real attitude about them when he showed up. Because that's the kind of power that they wealt. After all, they spoke for God. They, 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 they were the person on earth that would speak for God. That gave them a certain amount of power and a certain amount of position. But one thing I remember about, about uh, Samuel was, Despite the power that he had, it turns out he was not a very good father. Now, I'm mentioning that because it compares to Saul, who was a good father. And we'll come to that in a moment. Samuel, though, had decided finally, after God told him, go ahead and let him have a king, because that's all right by me. He finally said, okay, we'll go ahead and give him a king. But Samuel was smart. Uh, he wasn't going to pick somebody who was at the top of the pile. When, 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 it, when, they, when they cast lots, they cast lots and they, they chose a person they thought was going to be one of the weakest of all the kings. So I think Samuel was trying to find somebody who would not be a, not be a threat to him in his position. And so, so, he, so he proceeded to go after Saul. And where was Saul? According to scripture, Saul was hiding with the baggage. He was way back in the back, you know. Uh, Saul evidently didn't want to have anything to do with the king thing, because not only would he knew probably that he would be usurping some of the power of Samuel, that was not, not a good thing. He, would, after all, would be uh, working up against the man who was going to be uh, going to be speaking with God. And he knew too this job would not be an easy easy job. You know, when President Obama came into office some eight years ago, back 2004, his job was not enviable. That, that was not a position that anybody could really want, actually, because what you had was you had a complete destruction of, of the economic system in the United States. Many people lost their jobs. A lot, a lot of money was lost on, on, uh, in, 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 on Wall Street. I had, I had friends of mine who were ministers who had a lot of their retirement tied up in 401Ks. Uh, a lot of us lost money. I lost money, but I didn't. Mine was a balanced fund, so I didn't lose that much. I had a lot of stocks. I had a few. I had about about forty percent stocks, and the rest of it treasury notes and bonds, and that sort of stuff. That stuff didn't lose much. The stocks went, you went way down. And so I had a friend of mine who was who was into growth funds, and that means an awful lot of stocks, about seventy, eighty percent stocks. And so he lost big time. He was up down. He was planning on retiring early. He couldn't retire as early as he thought he was going to have to be retired. If the, finally, I think my, the, uh, the income, now all those funds have gotten back up to where they were and started to climb up a little bit more. And that's what, uh, that's what President Obama has done for us. But he had a very env unenviable position of having to come into a situation where he was facing a, a lot of Republicans. And for a while, he had Democrats for a while in there. But, uh, but he had a, very un a lot of tasks before him in which to do. Saul was like that. He, he, he realized that he was going to have to pull together the 12 tribes. Up to that time, the government had been uh, 12 confeder a confederation of 12 tribes. And whenever they wanted to decide something, they would gather together the elders, the representatives of each tribe, and kind of like a congress. And they, they, would, they, would, they would argue among themselves and decide what they ought to do. And that's how they decided something. Or they would ask Samuel, and Samuel would give them the word from God. And so that, that was the way things were done back then. But here Saul was going to have to find some way to pull them together almost into a federal-like government. It's kind of like uh, when this nation was started. It was, it was a nation like that too. We, the people, uh, the leaders from the various uh, colonies met to, uh, in, in, in conf and, uh, conventions like, in, in uh, congresses like, continental congress in fact it was called. And they would decide things. And there was a lot of arguing back and forth and all that sort of thing. And 
Finally, they'd fi finally co come to a conclusion. But they didn't have any real leader. They, they, had, they had, a, had a chairman who, who was elected by them to sit over and moderate the meeting. That's about all they had. And I remember Monroe sat there for a while. Madison sat there for a while. Uh, that these were positions that they're given some, some authority, but not the authority of a king anyway, and certainly not the authority of a president. So when George Washington comes up, even though he had a lot of support, nevertheless, it, th 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 there was going to be some, some difficulty pulling together the, the various states who all had their own ideas of what they ought to be able to do with themselves, and so he had to pull these people together. That's the way Saul was. He had to pull all these people together, and he did. He succeeded very well. And unlike Eli, now Eli was, was, was the priest before Samuel, he had two sons named Hophni and Phinehas. And according to Scripture, it says that they did evil in the sight of God. As it turns out, Samuel had two sons. I don't remember their names. But he had two sons, and they did evil in the sight of God. But you can't say that about Saul. Saul, for all his problems later on in life, raised two sons, two children, Jonathan, and I, I can't remember his, his daughter's name, but his daughter married, da married David. That was, that, was, that was David's first wife before Bathsheba. He was, uh, uh, and, and, and he, he raised them well. One thing he taught them, instilled within them, was loyalty the, to their friends. Jonathan maintained a continuous friendship with David. And so did so that so that his so that his daughter, who was who was now David's wife, she continued despite despite his infidelity. She continued to maintain her loyalty to her husband. And so I believe I, I credit Saul with having taught that. Saul did well to teach that, and yet he was always taking a back seat from the great king, which later on became David, and of course the even greater king of Solomon. So now we also come into the New Testament and this time about John the Baptist. Now we Baptists really like John the Baptist. After all, he was the forerunner of the Baptist movement, you know. Uh, the Catholics might, might claim St. Peter is the, the get, beginning of them for which the, for which the popes were selected. But, uh, but, but we Baptists claim, claim John the Baptist. He was our man. And uh, we, we really like this fellow. But one thing we could notice about him was he was not about the business of puffing himself up, making himself bigger, bigger, than, bigger than anyone else. Uh, he, he was a person who had, who had one time stated that I must decrease in order that he might increase. And I've always remembered that thought, although I haven't always applied it. When I, when I, was, when I, when I, when I was trying to, when I was a young, young minister many years ago, I longed to become a deacon. Now the deacons in our church, as far as I could tell, weld, they weld a lot of power. It seemed like they, they, they seemed any, time, any time that they brought something that they had discussed among themselves and brought it before the church to vote on, it was almost always voted on. And I looked at that and thought, boy, that's where the power base is. That's where the power is. And so after I had served as a Sunday school teacher and RA council with boys and and uh, this, that, and the other, all kinds of work. They finally decided, the nominating committee decided to put my name up for deacon. Now the old guess is finally great. I got an opportunity to get some real power. So my name was put out there on, on the vote one Sunday morning, and I lost. I didn't get the vote. I thought, this has got to be a mistake. They, they we got to have a recount. What's wrong with these people? I've got to be on that, on that list. After all, look at all I've done in this church. Second year came along. My name put back up there again. I thought, surely I'll be vindicated now. They have to elect me as deacon because I need the power. Second time came. I didn't get the vote then either. Somebody else passed, Somebody else got it before me. I was passed over again. It wasn't until about that time that I started studying what it meant to be a deacon. And I learned that in the, the word that we translate in Greek for deacon is diakonos. And diakonos means servant. It's the same word that we translate as pastor. Oftentimes in our churches, pastors seem to wield a lot of authority. Uh, and, I, and I know in, in some churches, the pastors control the money. 
I mean, I don't know about this kind of disdenomination. I don't know exactly how the polity is set up. I know in the Baptist church, usually the ministers have nothing to do with the money. <laughs> we stay as far away from the money as possible. That money is sitting down there in that offering plate, and that's as close as I get to the money. We, we don't get anywhere near, near the money. Somebody else takes care of the money. Uh, the trustees, the deacon, the treasurer, some, somebody else takes care of the money. And that's the way it is with, with the Baptists. And so so the, to, in, many, in many cases, in fact, uh, many, many of the churches I've been in, many of the, many of the pastors, where they may be standing up as I am, a kind of exalted position raised up in this pul- behind this pulpit. Nevertheless, I'm one of the servants with the flock. Each of you are part of the priesthood of believers. That's a concept that many of us Protestants believe in. That means we're all likewise ministers. We're all priests in our own, own sense. We're also supposed to go out and reach out, reach out to, to the world. The commission, the great commission, go ye into all the world, is given to each of us, not just in one individual, not, not just the, the deacons and that sort of thing. So when I finally realized what it was meant to be a deacon, to be a servant, then when my name was put up a third time, you know, sometimes th- three, time, three times is, 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 the, uh, is, is the one that you might win. You know, I wait up to that third strike. That's the one you get a home run. Finally, I got to be deacon on the third try. But I believe it was only because I finally realized what the true role of deacon was. We would divide up the, the total congregation, which at that time the church I was in was about 300 members. And we divide that up amongst the nine, nine, uh, nine deacons. I think I had, they, they told me I was, a, I was a young guy, so they let me get, get away with only 40 families <laughs> on my list. And we would visit all 40 families during, during the coming year. And uh, we, we were kind of the right-hand men, the helpers of the pastor, who also had responsibility for the whole, the whole particular church. That's why we look at a bishop. A bishop is also a servant. But a, but a bishop has responsibility for various churches under his charge. And so, and so he has responsibility for all the members of all the churches. And so he, he is a servant. He is a super servant in a sense rather than a super leader. And that, 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 that's, that, that's what it means to be a pastor. To take a secondary role. Fre- frequently we, we, don't, we don't look upon it that way. Uh, I thought I'd, I should have learned my lesson after my experience with deacon, but cut several years later, I felt a call to preach. And I remember God calling me to preach. I remember the exact words. He said, I was, sit, I was sitting out in my workshop, and, uh, and I, it was like fairly warm day. I was sitting in an old, old recliner I dragged up there and there, and uh, it was a fairly sunny day. I heard this voice say, Ed, I want you to preach. And I immediately remember giving him an argument. I said, oh, I, I can't do that. You know, that's, that, that, uh, I, I'm a musician. I, I can't be doing that. Uh, that, that. I don't know anything about doing that sort of thing. I'm, 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 not, I'm not worthy, Lord. I'm not, not, not ready to do this. I'm not ready to make that kind of commitment. And the voice came a second time. Ed, I want you to preach. I said, oh, no, Lord, I can't be doing that. It, it, you mean I'll have to go back to school. I mean, I'll have to, I guess I'll have to, uh, I'll have to have to go to go to college and go to seminary. I mean, that's years and years of study just to be able to be able to pastor in a church and be able to preach. I I just can't imagine doing that. And then the voice came a third time. Ed, I want you to preach. <laughs> and I remember saying, "Okay." <laughs> I made my made my my my, my statement that, uh, that God had called me to preach at the church the following Sunday. And there was an awful lot of praise, and people patted you on the back, and it was a wonderful experience. <clears throat> and I began thinking what it was going to be like for me to be a preacher. And I went back to college. I transferred a lot of the credits of all the other colleges I'd been to. Uh, I got out of USC in about a year and a half. I went on to seminary for three years. And when I got out of there, I told myself, okay, I, I, I probably, probably fully expect that I'll be a Pastor, I began with a pastorate probably in a small church of maybe 200 members or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's it. And then by the time I'm about, about five or six years, I would have climbed up the ladder, and maybe I'll be up to a church that's got 300 members. 
And then by the time I'm probably about after 20 years or so, well, I'll be up to 1,000, maybe 2,000 members. Oh, I had plans. I had real great plans for my life. Yes, I, I knew exactly what, what was going to happen to me now. I was getting to a big, big church, some big cathedral by the time I was ready to retire. I'd be a bishop, perhaps. I'd be a, in the Baptist church, they only have bishops, and Baptist church would do, uh, we'd be, a, we'd be a, a state convention president, perhaps. Uh, we'd be a, maybe even a national convention, the Southern Baptist Church National Convention President. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that'd be my position after pastoring these big, mega churches. You know what? About the biggest church I have ever pastored has had 35 members. Sometimes, sometimes we, we get into a situation where we think of ourselves too good. <laughs> We look at ourselves and think that, 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 that we're just too good for this sort of thing. And we think, we, we think very highly of ourselves and don't realize God may not mean what you think he means. Ed, I want you to preach, may not exactly mean everything. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the great church fathers long ago, St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, I, I'm not Catholic, but uh, I, know, I know Brother Redfern has studied on Catholic. He went to a Catholic school when he was growing up. So he's got more knowledge of, the, of Catholicism than I do. But but, but, uh, but, but St. Francis of Assisi had a statement. And I have it, I have it on, I have it on a, 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 a picture frame and put it up in my, in, my, in my office at home. And it says, preach at all times and sometimes use words. And that's a paraphrase. I don't remember exactly what he said. But basically it says that your, your, your life, in fact, is to be a, a sermon. Your life is supposed to be lived that way. I mean, I know each of you probably have known somebody in your life that's salt of the earth, we call it. That, that this, you know, that, that they were so sweet, they were so, so good that you know that God truly walked with them. Uh, I knew an old fellow who was a deacon. I met him when I got to be deacon finally. His name was Yates. And old Mr. Yates, he was, uh, he was a fine old fellow. He owned a business down on uh, Two Nights Road as a wheel, had a wheel alignment company. Uh, Yates Shara, maybe some of you have actually, actually gone by his place long, long ago. And he, he was a fine old fellow. You could always rely upon Yates to, to, uh, to, to, to lend a hand. To all, he was always one of those deacons, always ready to help out. Uh, when we, we had some deacons who would show up, and, they, and one guy came out and said, we ought to, we ought to put sidewalks all around the church. That's what we need. We need sidewalks all over the place. And so, uh, and so it fell to Yates and me to investigate how much it would cost. And in those days, it was long ago, it cost $35,000 to put sidewalks all over the place. And we came back and told them how much it cost. And those people who, who made the proposal said, oh, forget it, forget it, forget it, just forget it. Now, th th these, guys, th these guys were the kind of deacons that wanted to be, they wanted the power, actually. I guess they wanted the power. They wanted to make ma major decisions. Somebody else could do the work. And Yates and I were the ones who actually did the work, and then we did the work, and find out, oh, it costs too much, forget it. Now, forget I said it, just forget it. <laughs> and that's the way they were about it. But Yates was willing to go ahead and do the work, do the painting, do, do the wallpaper, do whatever it necessary to do be done. He was that kind of person. And that's the kind of person we all are supposed to be. Our life is supposed to be a sermon. John the Baptist was, was a man who, whose life exuded that. Once he recognized that his cousin Jesus, that all you would know that Jesus, was, Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins, uh, the, the, once he found out that his, 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 uh, his cousin Jesus was, was, was actually son of God, he backed off. I mean, he was, he was in a position of some authority. Some believe that Jesus and John the Baptist used to be co-pastors together in a separate ministry. But at some point in time, Jesus felt a need to pull away from John and went out and started his own ministry. And that led to the calling of the 12 disciples. And at one time, Jesus had close to 70 disciples. And he had lots, lots, lots of disciples. And so, but, 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 but John the Baptist could very easily have said to himself now, now, you, you guys stay here with me. But here's in the text, we see that uh, he was standing there. He, he, he saw Jesus coming across and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And his disciples heard that. And two of his disciples left 
John the Baptist. They're, they're a leader. They're a pastor. And they left him and went to be with somebody else. Did John say, wait, whoa, stop, come back here. Where do you think you're going? I got work for you to do over here. I'm the man. Hey, I'm the man. Look at me. He didn't say that at all. He let them go. Because that's what he has said in another gospel. I must decrease in order that he might increase. That's the way we ought to be ourselves. Saul was like that. He, 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 was, he, was, he taught his children well. And he, he, was, he, he realized finally that it was up to him to decrease in order that God might increase. He finally came to his senses and understood that. He was better than some kings who never figured that out. There were many kings of Israel who never got it. There are many kings and presidents we have had in, in the White House who never get it. I think, that, uh, I think that President Obama gets it. I think that in many respects he's been one of, uh, along with Jimmy Carter and some of the others, he's been one, well, some of those who really have been a model for all of our children to follow. He has raised his two daughters to be young women who are ready to go out into the world and still, even still, you still they look, look like little kids, but uh, uh, with those of us who remember when they were little, you know, remember they're still little kids, but, uh, uh, but, 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 but now, now they've become young women, so you can see the handiwork of, of Michelle and, and uh, Barack in, the, in, their, in their raising of the children. And they, they've shown, that Barack, our president, has shown himself to be a person that you can depend upon to take the more appropriate action. Not necessarily to, to take, take a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, I, I pray for uh, upcoming President Trump that he will learn the, that that's an aspect. He's still kind of in his campaign mode. He hadn't, he hadn't converted yet into being president yet. And I hope that he will make that change. He's going to find a rude awakening. Uh, most, I remember many candidates get out there and talk about all the things they plan on doing. They can do this, and they can do this, and they can do this, and they can do that. And most of the time, they don't have the authority to do any of that. They, they can't just decide to, uh, to, uh, to ha have, a, have a tariff, and we're going to put on a tariff. Uh, the, the tar only one that can do tariffs are Congress. They all have to agree, and then he can sign the tariff bill when it's made. But it, it's left up to Congress to decide whether to have a tariff or not. A lot of things presidents can do, but a lot of things they cannot do. So Pre President Trump is going to be in for a rude awakening when he finds out the things he cannot do as president. And I pray for him that, that, that God will truly lead him. You know, he's, he's Episcopalian, and uh, he's Episcopalian, I learned he's Episcopalian. He's a member of Episcopalian Church in New York. And I pray that he, he will, he'll remember the teachings he's learned in the Episcopal Church, which also teach about servanthood. We ourselves are meant to be servants, and we are to come as we are, giving ourselves to the Lord. That's what we ought to do. As John the Baptist was, as St. Francis of Assisi was, a person who realized that we are to decrease in order and lift God up in all things. Let us pray. And then, Father, we do thank you that you are there for us and you are always above us. And we always have you to look upon and give us strength in the daily walk that we